You are listening to a free version of the Majority Report with Sam Steeter. To support the show and get another 15 minutes of daily program, go to majority.fm, please. The Majority Report with Sam Steeter. It is Wednesday, April 11th, 2018. My name is Michael Brooks, and I'm Michael Wednesday. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's show, Alex Huckley, a San Paulo based writer, researcher, host of the Alpha Bunga Bunga Global Politics Podcast, co host of that podcast. We're talking about the soft coup in Brazil, the imprisonment of Lula, and an encroaching neo fascism that goes back several years in Brazil. Mark Zuckerberg was an android in front of the Senate. Senators asked him some seemingly tough questions and promised no regulatory or policy follow-through. What a shock. Trump is promising action in Syria. Russia has vetoed a UN motion to investigate the chemical weapons attacks. And of course, one can only be thankful that Hillary Clinton is not president, taking us into World War III. Trump promises the missiles will be coming. Apparently, they have not come yet. Border agents. uh, New videos emerge of U.S. border agents trying to dump an injured man over the Mexican border as part of the ongoing pileup of atrocities in the basically in the implementation of Trump's and the Republicans anti-immigration agenda Oklahoma teachers have continued their walkout and large crowds are coming to show solidarity and support and good things can also go viral teachers in Arizona have threatened to go on strike due to low pay and in response to corporate tax breaks that, of course, has been synchronized with their low pay. One of the worst human beings, not only in America, but on planet Earth, is not seeking re-election. We bid adieu to Paul Ryan, who, after dedicating his political life to causing human misery and increasing suffering of every shape and variety, domestic and international, has announced that his work is done after a generation-busting tax redistribution through the wealthy scheme. He can rest assured that more people will go hungry, more children will not have heat, and fewer Americans will have health care. Mission accomplished. Now he can go make some real money and seriously benefit from some of the oligarch policies. That's correct. I think that crowd, though, was saying Paul Ryan sucks because Paul Ryan isn't, uh, you know, overtly racist. But yes, <laughs> Paul Ryan does suck. Um, truly, just utterly loathsome and contemptible figure. And another person that, you know, we'll see plenty of, you know, never Trumper types and people who don't like having a, you know, a grotesque president with a personality disorder, but want to separate him from the Republican Party or you know, going to gaze longingly and talk about how, you know, Paul Ryan agree or disagree with civil and all sorts of horrible, grotesque ways of remembering. He's a wonk. Yeah. Yeah. He's a real wonk. This um, guy whose, you know, entire being in public office was to gut and destroy the already meager American social safety net and was you know, put increasing human suffering at the front and center of all of his policy making, And I don't care what his, you know, intentions were. Uh, it, utterly irrelevant. That's what he did. That's what his policy agenda was. Now, what, do you want to play this instead? Okay, this is um, Paul Ryan. I don't, uh, is this on the list? This is Paul Ryan this morning uh, announcing his resignation announcing rather that he won't be seeking re-election 
I cannot stress enough how important it is to, you know, you can set my polemics aside, but any political write-up for this guy has to say that he came in, voted for the invasion of Iraq, supported the entire Bush agenda, uh, and made his name as somebody who wrote a absolutely savage budget and attack on Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Um, and of course, was a bag man for every corporate interest imaginable from a policy perspective. This is Paul Ryan. I'm worried about the impact of your announcement on the 2018 midterms and uh, perhaps sending a signal that the House has lost for... Yeah, I really, I, I, I gave it some consideration, but I really do not believe whether I stay or go in 2019 is going to affect a person's individual race for Congress. I really don't think a person's race for Congress is going to hinge on whether Paul Ryan's speaker or not. So I really don't think it affects it. Look, if we do our jobs, which we are, we're going to be fine as a majority. Um, I'm grateful for the president to give us this chance to actually get this stuff done. I'm grateful that we have unified government that the president, with his victory, gave us so that we get all these big things done. We're going to have a great record to run on. We have a great economy, great accomplishments, more to do. And I really don't think that the American people are going to want to have the gridlock that the Democrats are promising. So I'm confident we can run through the tape and we can get this done. I mean, the only important note besides all the pablum there is the fact that, again, in the never Trumper universe, this guy's going to be held in contrast to Trump as, you know, somebody who was polite and didn't pro- overtly promote bigotry. He was with Trump every step of the way. And as you can see there, I mean, that is, again, the constant refrain and, and clarity that people need to get. I mean, Trump is a Republican. He is the perfect Republican president. He's implementing the exact agenda that these people want. And if they need to overlook some stuff that they might find you know, uncouth or distasteful, they're perfectly happy to do it in the service of legislating American oligarchy. Obviously, more broadly, there's a American conversation beyond Republicans about what Trump represents with regards to things like foreign and policy, particularly, I would argue. But, you know, Paul Ryan... Um, that's his legacy. He was, uh, an enabler of Trump, a savage, uh, you know, Dickensian led social Darwinist legislator. And, uh, I'm sure, you know, he's still young. He'll go on to do many more, uh, harmful things. I was hoping to see him lose to Bryce. I was hoping so too. Check out Randy Bryce. Um, Look, guys, we are actually starting to get, as we move into the summer, and I think it's very important to keep a broader perspective than just the electoral cycle and the deeper dynamics, but we are going to you know, get fairly soon to, like, we got to flip Congress. That needs to happen. It's very, very important to get Democrats in control of the House. Uh, that's a for real and urgent task. All right, we got a few ads that we're going to jump to uh, that— I I like because I feel so strong about my ads because I love the products. Do you see that uh, Sam has recorded? So please take a, a check them out. Great deals uh, for you. And then we'll come back uh, to me for a second, and then we will go uh, to Alex Huckley to talk about Brazil. Hey, folks! You've heard me talk about Brooklinen.com before. My favorite sheets I've owned since those. Um, those cotton, like I had sheep sheets when I was in college, like 30 years ago. And I remember, like, they were always, like, they were cool. They get softer, but they were always cool because of the type of cotton. And that is what I love about my Brooklyn and sheets. Look, you spend a third of your life in your sheets. They make a, they make a huge difference on how you sleep. Brooklinen.com are the best, most comfortable sheets I have ever owned. They are also, and as you know, I don't like to spend a lot of money. There's no big markup. Upgrade your nightly routine. Help you feel more well-rested every day. Brooklinen was founded in April of 2014 by a husband and wife team, Vicky and Rich Fulop. Their philosophy was pretty simple. The most beautiful, comfortable home essentials. No crazy prices. Most bedding is marked up as much as 300%. Did you know that? My sister used to work in uh, like a home, what do you call those? Home accessory. Furnishings? Yeah, sort of furnishings. Markups are insane. 
Brooklyn and no, uh, no such markup. They've cut out the middleman or middlewoman. It's the fastest growing betting brand in the world. Over 15,000 five star reviews. They were named best online betting category by Good Housekeeping. They have all sorts of versatile colors and patterns. You can mix and match, complement any decor. My Brooklyn and sheets are the best. They're the most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Brooklinen.com has an exclusive offer for Majority Report listeners. Get 20 bucks off and free shipping when you use the promo code MAJORITY at brooklinen.com. They're so confident with their sheets, they're going to offer you a risk-free 60-night satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. Only way to get 20 bucks off and free shipping, use the promo code MAJORITY at brooklinen.com. That's brooklinen, B-R-O-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code MAJORITY. Brooklinen, these are the best sheets ever. Now back to Michael with uh, the rest of today's show. So did you know, Matt, that you, you were in sheets so much? Did you know that? Matt, Matt, he's not listening. <laughs> I love those where he's just like, did you know that the average mammal spends a fourth of their time next to a comforter? Matt? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah well, I, 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 wasn't, I didn't particularly uh, study that, but uh, yes. <laughs> I, I love Matt's I'm not listening recoveries. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> wasn't particularly engaged that uh, that course of, uh, but yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. All right, we're gonna take a brief break. We'll be right back with Alex Huckley. Back to the Majority Report. I'm Michael Brooks. Joining us now is Alex Huckley. He's a writer and researcher based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He's also the producer and co-host of the Alpha Bunga Bunga Global Politics Podcast. Alex, how are you doing? Hi, I'm great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for doing this. Uh, We need to sort of untangle what's happening in Brazil it's really a story that's much more understood in the context of a uh, a, a soft coup and also um, in a, a global pattern of a resurgent extremist far right and, you know, a, essentially a new stance of capital to not even negotiate for a sort of win-win social democracy. But we need to 
In order to unpack that, we need to go through the specifics of the corruption charges and this broader kind of sprawling investigation of Brazil. But first, let's really work backwards. We're going to get an understanding of what the Workers' Party is and who uh, Lula uh, is as a political figure. Let's go back to 2002 when uh, Lula uh, da Silva was elected president. This was, I believe, his third or fourth try in running for president. And it was branded globally that Lula had become, he had moderated. He had gone, he had sort of, from being a firebrand labor leader to a, you know, the, 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 the words, the buzzwords of the sort of global technocracy, a pragmatist, a, you know, and so on and so forth. He actually really was in a way that I think is extremely defensible, which we'll get to. Uh, but that meant something actually in a Brazilian context, which will set the stage for understanding the types of deals and partnerships that were made that describe the situation today. But maybe you can take us back to 2002, explain that campaign, that positioning of Lula, and how it fit into the broader history of the Workers' Party that he came from. Right. So when we talk about moderation, I think it's important to understand who Lula was even prior to this. Right. So he emerged as a labor leader within the metal workers in in kind of suburban Sao Paulo um, in the late 70s during the military dictatorship. He is a very charismatic figure. He's a very talented political operator and organizer um, and has immense personal credibility. But he was always, despite his militancy, a moderator. His skill was in bringing parties together and getting deals out of um, the owners of car plants, for example, right? Getting wage deals. Mm -hmm. Um, He, in his speech recently, just before he was taken to prison, uh, recalls this, kind of recalling back um, memorably um, that he was, that a lot of the workers in the union were pushing for a much higher wage increase um, and that eventually he gave in to their demands. So, you know, he was there making reference to the fact that he was a moderator, right? Mm -hmm. so this is his modus operandi, and I think that's important to, to remember as we go forward. So if we move forward to 2002, that election, he had already, as you said, lost um, previous elections, often by quite little um, since redemocratization um, in 1989, which was the first, um, the first kind of fully open democratic elections after the military dictatorship. He wrote a letter, famous letter, called The Letter to the Brazilian People, which is really the letter to Brazilian capital and to international capital, saying we're going to play nice, we're going to be moderate, um, we're going to be kind of third wayist, uh, we're going to implement some social programs, but we're not going to rock the boat. Um, and, you know, some people on the left placed hopes on him that this was just a way of getting elected, not, you know, not scaring off the Brazilian bourgeoisie too much to get elected, and then he would implement something more radical. That doesn't happen. Um, There's even splits off from uh, his party early on. He brings in a pension reform. um, So that leads to the creation of the uh, Party of Socialism and Liberty, um, which still exists and runs kind of left uh, to the left of PT, to the Workers' Party. Um, So already in those early stages, you can see that kind of moderation, a break off from the left to the left. Um, And, you know, he, he gets wrapped up in early on. This is a kind of interesting foreshadowing of the car wash investigations and all the corruption uh, politics and anti-corruption politics that emerge in 2013, 2014. In 2005, there's a big, uh, it's called the Mesalo, it's a big monthly payment scandal where he was basically buying off um, other congressional parties uh, and to buy their votes, right, to get laws passed. Um, This was a big scandal. It led to more disillusionment with the Workers' Party. Um, and foreshadowed the kind of things that were to come. Um, But what it also does tell us, and I guess we'll come on to this when we talk more broadly about kind of Brazilian corruption, is that this is the way Brazilian politics works in the new republic, right? You've got a million little parties. I say a million. There's 35 political parties in Brazil. I think 33 effective. I think there's something like 27 in Congress, right? Right. This is this is world historic levels. I mean, you know, no one else in the world has this many effective parties in Congress. And the vast I mean, not even like India, just to like really put a point on it. I mean, India like has also this, you know, global in some ways deserved reputation that it's, you know, it's also a big, massive, you know, flawed, very heterogeneous but also democratic culture in that there's parties that span everywhere from the you know the left and neoliberal to the extreme right but also parties that represent like you know a specific like 
a Dalit party or a party that represents a specific geography. Like India has that reputation. It's true to yeah. an extent. Brazil is like double that. I mean, Bra no, Bra and, and, yeah. there's, and just to correct you, because there's something yeah. an important yeah, difference. Because yeah. while in India that you might have regional parties, parties which represent, represent narrow sectionalist interests or a specific strata of society regionally and so on. Right. In Brazil, most of these parties do not represent anything. Like <laughs> you can read the names of the parties, and one's called progressive, one's called republican, one's called uh, social democratic, one's called labor. Like it just be like a couple of people being like, yeah. let's form our own little clique. Yeah, and they yeah. they. Um, depend on their existence by the relationship to the state, not to the relationship to a social base. Right. So they're cartel parties. I mean, that's the kind of technical term for these things. Right. They're cartel parties. Um, the largest of which is the PMDB, which led the, which was the sort of um, legitimate opposition, the accepted in-house opposition to the military dictatorship. Um, they come out of that, but you know, as time goes on, they become more and more corrupt, and they're the they're. You know, they have representatives in every state at all levels of, of politics, um, but they're just the largest cartel party. And they ally them, the PT, the Workers Party, ally uh, themselves with this PMDB party. They've now called, this is another foreshadowing of what's to come, they've now rebranded to MDB, which is their original name, which is the movement for um uh, the movement for democ for Brazilian democracy, um, shedding the party label, right? So that's kind of saying we're not, we're not, we're not a political party, we're not political. Um, which kind of tells you a little bit about the kind of anti-political mood in Brazil today. Right. Um, but anyway, I mean, you know, so it's, we, because you've got to strike deals with all these parties who don't really mean anything, don't represent anything, um, it's going to create corruption. I mean, and, and, you know, we've got to say that corruption is a facet of um, the semi-periphery, of politics of the semi-periphery. It's a, it's a factor everywhere, right? It's a factor that, everywhere, but can I just, I'll draw another, and I know, you know, people, yeah. like, you know, this is tricky because I know you have a level of precision which we want, and then I want to get to the successes of Lula on the flip side, but I think it's very, very important to really underline this because when he came into power, I... Two things happen. I mean, one was that yes, there's this. It's very important in the in the global press, in the Western press. It's like, oh well, when he says moderate, it's the letter to capital that you were talking about, the letter to the Brazilian people. It's that I'm going to pay off World Bank loans. But what it also meant was that we're willing to make compromises. We're going into essentially a structurally corrupt state, and we're willing to make compromises with the existing order in order to gain power. And I think distinctly in workers party case and this is one of the reasons why you know maintain some sympathy actually also deliver for people so in other words they you know they did actually you know generate real social programs but but the the context so like if we go to south africa and we say okay you know Jacob Zuma was turning a young democracy that obviously already had serious problems structurally and with corruption and everything else but he himself was, and the government, the, the the cell he presided over, they're trying to turn it into this pure kleptocracy, which it was not yeah. under Mandela and Mbeki, right? Whatever and, the and other. And it problem. wasn't, and it wasn't to the same degree under Lula either. Well, well, no, and that, mean, well, Zuma I'm actually was, saying that Lula was inheriting a state almost that Zuma was trying to create. So, in other words, he's coming into a state and making deals with a state that already is so structurally corrupted that in order to be quote unquote moderate, you are inevitably going to find yourself in those types of arrangements. And that gets, that's the point I'm trying to make. Yeah, that's right. right. You're, you're, you're coming into a game and you're having to play by its rules right. and not your own. And it's worth remembering that PT was always the ethical party. You know, right. this was the party which was against corruption. Um, so, the problem is that when you come in riding a white horse, uh, you're going to fall off. And this is a kind of a, one of these kind of truisms about politics. But, you know, it happened to Tony Blair in Britain, for that matter, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so which also explains a little bit the degree of disillusionment that happened with the Workers' Party, too. Um, dis, you know, Lula's personal popularity notwithstanding, um, precisely because they were, you know, supposedly the ethical party. Um, and prove themselves to play by the play by the rules of, of the pre-existing game, which um, you know is a creates corruption. There's no no kind of two ways about it. But what were so yeah, and I guess so, the, I guess the angle I'm pushing though is that maybe it's like there's a distinction between going in to corrupt yourself for the sake of it versus saying you know playing with the, the very dangerous game of let's engage in some of that to actually deliver some real material gains. So maybe we could then talk about the record, you know, the good and the bad of Lula through Dilma. You know, what 
what were the achievements in social policy and how long did this sort of uh, mm, sort of uh, uh, cold peace with capital last? Yeah. So, I mean, what you've got basically what could be called a, a sort of marriage between a sort of neo-developmentalism, quite soft neo-developmentalism with a broad kind of macroeconomic neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. So they're playing by the rules of the Washington consensus. They're, they're paying back World Bank loans. Um, but at the, at the same time, they're massively broadening and deepening um, the Bolsa Familia program, which is a cash tran conditional cash transfer program, um, which took millions out of poverty. They were able to eradicate hunger. Um, one of the most significant things that they were able to bring in more workers into the formal economy and they uh, strengthened kind of remuner remuneration in the formal economy. So they significantly increased year on year minimum wages, um, which is in some ways probably the most significant, um, significant development and significant um, improvement in, in living standards that was brought in under PT. Those are the those are the sort of the main things we could kind of go into other details about um, what they did. But you know, the, the, the important thing is that these are significant gains in a country which has never really seen a government um, operating in the interests of the majority. Right. So it's an immense forward step. And yet, you know, you step back and you go, but it's still quite limited. Um, these were not structural transformations to the economy. Right. There's a question about whether that would even have been possible kind of once they were in government, the need to strike deals, the, the makeup of Congress, um, maybe those structural transformations wouldn't have been possible. Yep. But what they didn't do, um, and this, I think tells a little bit about why they were able to be deposed. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to be clear that the blame is on, on the right. <laughs> the blame is on the right for the soft coup, but PT did things which didn't help its case later on, which is to say two, two reforms that they could have carried out, which they didn't, were, would have been political reform to kind of clean up this, this dirty Congress, you know, create a, situ a more representative situation, uh, one where these small parties don't flourish and depend on the state. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing would have been media reform to break up what is one of the world's largest media conglomerates, Globo, um, which exercises uh, a significant weight in Brazilian, not just the media landscape, but in politics. Uh, and those two things would have certainly strengthened its position when uh, when the, the economic winds changed and consequently the right decided we're not playing ball anymore. So then get us to, right. So then when was it that the right? I mean, it was in the my understanding is it started in Dilma Rousseff, who is, you know, uh, Lula's successor, you know, not the same sort of charismatic figure, but actually also a very, you know, very interesting and intelligent and competent figure, you know, at least legislatively or govern, governance wise in her own right. It started in her uh, first term and it obviously accelerated in her second term because she was removed. When did this sort of, you know, yeah, like when did the peace stop? And was this a just sort of backlash of Brazilian ruling classes or and and you know you look at things like the Atlas project and sort of like funding kind of like libertarian propaganda in Latin America mm -hmm. it there does seem to be this broader pattern that across Latin America we went from you know I mean when Lula was in power for a while I mean he represented the, the you know, very moderate center left in a region that you know good and bad had some you know at least rhetorically some serious left governments and then there was this backlash and reverse wave um which really led a lot of governments to the right um so i guess what i'm saying was was there something new in brazil in the back like there was the backlash but it also seemed like there was a lot of social forces kind of yearning actually to return to things like military dictatorship and and traditional race and class hierarchies Right. And I think it's important to, I mean, my interpretation of these, and I, and I think I, I will, you know, I'll stand by this, that it is the, the soft coup is, is a rolling coup. It is not a right. plot or a conspiracy, which has come from the outside. Like, right, we're going to take these guys down because yeah. that doesn't entirely make sense. Like they're so PT are so moderate, the Brazilian bourgeoisie can work with them. They do strike deals with them and they have good, you know, they had, they had a good time. They had a really good time. They had a much better time than, than the lives of the poor. Um, right. you know, despite however much those, those, those lives improved, loads of billionaires were created. So it doesn't entirely explain why, whether it's the U S or, you know, fractions of the Brazilian bourgeoisie get together to plot there to take them down. Right. Uh, that isn't to say there is no conspiracy, you know, there is no conspiring at all. Right. There is, but you know, it's a rolling coup and it's an, it's an emergent process where loads of different factors come in. So let me just kind of go through those. Yeah. Juma's elected 
and it's a, a, probably Lula's greatest victory, was to get this relative unknown and relatively uncharismatic figure, uh, Juma Hussef, elected in 2010. She gets reelected in 2014 in a narrower contest, but, you know, she still wins by by a fair margin, you know, a, a much wider margin than kind of recent U.S. elections, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I think the moment that the center right loses for the fourth time in a row, the presidential election in 2014, they decide we need to take her down. But there's something that predates this and something that isn't discussed enough, I think, in international media to understand Brazil in 2018 even 2017 and even 2016, which is to say the June 2013 protests, which was a massive wave of protests, which erupted out of the blue and took all observers by surprise. I was uh, not living in Brazil at the time, and I was like kind of glued to, to news at the time, just trying to understand what was going on. Um, there were, uh, it was a bus fares protest, you know, kind of led by a sort of autonomous group campaigning for, for free transport. Mm -hmm. That then faces police repression and the thing explodes, mm -hmm. right? And we see, we've see we seen kind of similar, I mean, for, for listeners who aren't familiar with that case, you know, you can think about the Gezi Park protests in Turkey or various other kind of, um, kind of sudden mobilizations which don't take a determined political form, aren't led by a political party, are pretty um, broad-based uh, with a whole range of different demands all spilling out at once. You know, the Arab Spring even starts like that, right? Yep. Um, so this happens, and... Because of its lack of leadership at the time, uh, it becomes increasingly channelized by the right towards a narrow anti-corruption discourse, a moralistic anti-corruption discourse, which increasingly targets the Workers' Party. Right. This really is a, is a sort of a blob, right? It, it's kind of changing shape. It's moving. In 2014, it's more focused around uh, the World Cup. Uh, kind of these these campaigns that they say we're not going to have the World Cup or we need a different World Cup we need a popular World Cup uh, against wasting of you know kind of these big white elephant projects and so on. But by 2015, it is solidified into a right wing street movement and new street movements pop up, protest movements. One called Come to the Streets, another one called uh, uh, kind of on the indignados online i guess is one way to to translate it another one is a free brazil movement which has now be, just become a quite hard right movement which you know they set up as a sort of libertarian thing and became hard right um but they lead these really big street protests and that puts a lot of pressure on the workers party um and puts a lot of pressure on juma who at the same time uh is de has decided to roll back from her sort of developmentalist program from her first term mm -hmm. and to start implementing all the austerity that the right demands or nearly all of it so that loses. So, so actually, that that's that's interesting because, and this is you know obviously you know far more than me, but things like the the bus protests, which I did follow to some extent, and certainly the stuff around the the World Cup and the Olympics, those protests struck me. You said Gezi, which were left protests, right? Yeah. And so they struck me as anti-austerity protests. And I remember even, you know, there was actually very interesting footage footage of uh, Lula meeting with some youth protesters and essentially giving them actually kind of like an Obama style, like, yeah, like, you know, don't give up on the process, but, you know, you're doing exactly what you should be doing. And sort of like, you know, this is what you need to do if you want to kind of push us in the right direction, essentially. Except and, that that wasn't entirely the Workers' Party response. No, I no, well, not legislatively. I mean, you just explained that, that, that Dilma, you know, actually was totally capitulating. But I'm more interested in how did what started as an anti-austerity process turn into an anti-corruption, anti-politics, and then turn to a hard right movement? How did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Indeed, how did that happen? Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, you know, <laughs> I can't say that I have yeah. um, a kind of t absolutely clear answer on how that happened. I think we're still seeing it unfold in a way. And so we're still examining it. I mean, what it was absolutely a democratic um, protest right. in the sense of making social democratic demands. It was for better um, hospitals, better schools against corruption, um, just for, for the creation of a social state, really. Um, and this was, you know, a lot of kind of young people, um, who had recently got into university, probably the first of their generation, you know, the first generation in their family to get to university, um, who in some ways have been disappointed by the lack of progress under the workers party. Right. And so for all that loads of people were, you know, 40 million were lifted out of poverty. It, it was a bit on, it was a bit uneven. And so some people were still feeling the pinch there or were disappointed by the lack of progress and, these democratic demands then somehow 
become channeled towards this anti-corruption uh, discourse, right? Which which targets the Workers' Party as somehow this gang of pol corrupt politicians, which has come into power, taken the state away from its natural owners, and uh, and and ruled. Uh, in the most corrupt manner possible, just basically emptying the coffers of the state. That's the that was the sort of discourse that emerged. So and that's this was on led the street. By, this was led by the corporate media. Um, right. Okay. And and you know it, it depends who you talk to. Some people say that you know these were the June 2013 days. That's what they're called. Um, some people say that by by the late June or July or August of that year, they had already become kind of right wing. I don't quite buy that. I think it took it was a it was a longer term process, but because it was so inchoate, because it didn't have any leadership, because it didn't, uh, it had a kind of flurry of demands, but pointing in various different directions, uh, it was able to be channeled um, by by those with uh, the wherewithal and the and the kind of institutional power to to drive that into a different direction. How do, when does the legal process start? Car wash, the Petrobras investigation, and what you know. What have we actually learned about, I guess, I mean, the charges against Lula? Maybe you could just give us a brief tour here. What was yeah. Dilma actually removed from office for? What are the charges against Lula? And then more broadly, if we're going to consider all of it, what are the corruption charges, as an example, leveled against the current acting president of this you know, current far-right government at the moment? So... I mean, just to just to state the kind of the three major factors behind yeah. soft coup, the kind of backdrop. So you've got a sudden mass mobilization, street protests, which hadn't really been a major factor over the preceding decade. Suddenly, as of 2013, become a regular feature of Brazilian life, especially in the big cities um, and of all sorts. Right. So it's suddenly like Brazilians are going to the street all the time. The second thing is the end of the commodity super cycle, um, which right. is basically it's the tw 2008 crisis hitting Brazil in a delayed fashion. The right. PT had actually managed to it, through through fiscal policy to avoid that for a long time and to delay its impact. But then it hits and it hits hard and it starts in 2014, 2015, 2016. It, Brazil's in a deep depression. Um, those are two factors. The other one, then, as you said, is the beginning of the car wash investigations, which really begin in earnest in 2014 uh, and explode in 2015. Um, it starts with a money laundering operation in, at a car wash, hence the name. Um, and, and they, through the use of uh, plea bargaining, it kicks up the, the kicks up the ranks of politicians, right? So everyone's, um, kind of submitting plea bargains on someone else and the thing just explodes and broadens and broadens and broadens. Um, what ends up taking down Juma Rousseff has nothing to do with that. They tried to get her on that and they couldn't find any evidence. Right. So They've decided we need to take her out after the 2014 elections. They've, the the centre-right have decided we need to take her out. This is enough is enough. We can't trust the Workers' Party to implement the degree of austerity that we demand. Uh, and there's recordings and there's statements even after the fact saying the reason why she had to be impeached was because she didn't sign up to our bridge to the future plan, which was um, confected by mainly by the PMDB, uh, by Tamer's government. Right now, the current um, government of Michelle, by the Tamer. current government, the current yeah. illegitimate government, right. uh, the, which was a you know this brutal austerity plan, uh, a twenty-year constitutional ceiling on um, on on state budgets, right on the on the right. federal budget. Um, right. So this austerity program, you know, they they whatever they decided that the Workers Party couldn't be trusted with this, so they've got to take her out. They finally settle on impeachment, you know, and I think it's again this is the the point against the idea that. This was a pre completely premeditated plot that was seen uh, out to the letter. You know, th yeah. it, they they don't know what the hell they're doing, right? right. They, these are and the important point: they are not fit to rule Brazil because they are incapable of uh, overseeing Brazilian development, and they're incapable of even overseeing this, you know, <laughs> this kind of undemocratic, anti-democratic transition. Right. They just seize on things, and then things become worse, and they try to firefight, uh, and you end up in a situation today where. You know, you, you basically got the, the second uh, most likely person to win the, the elections this year to be a far right, even fascist candidate. So yeah, we'll, we'll get, get to that in a few minutes. Yeah. But yep. just uh, just to paint the picture that this is an emergent rolling coup um, and they don't know what really what they're doing. So they settle on impeachment um, and they settle on the most flimsy grounds, which is basically um, what is called like a fiscal maneuvering where Juma took credit from state budgets to then pay them back later. You know, I mean, the kind of most m minute thing, which like no one but the most kind of geeky think tank types would even care about or even know what it is. The means, analogy right? I've drawn is that, you know, if the Republicans actually got the votes together to impeach Obama, 
for um, you know a, a, a CBO score being used in a budget that they didn't agree with. I mean, it really is almost on that level. It, it, it is that level, and yeah. it passed. And everyone, I think, this is what really made the kind of global news. I imagine your listeners will have seen this was the the vote in Congress for this, where people dedicating um, their votes for the impeachment to everything from like their family to God to their dog to uh, the. <laughs> Uh, military leader who who was like who oversaw who oversaw torture during the military dictatorship, right. which was probably the most disgusting spectacle of all. Because uh, Dilma was tortured herself when she was a guerrilla fighter, exactly. which is in the beginning of her career. I mean, right? So it's, yeah, it's sort of yeah. doubly disgusting. Yeah, right. And and so that outrage that outrages everyone, and even the international media tone changes because before that everyone's going oh all these people are on the streets uh, demanding an end to corruption they must be great let's back them they're all waving the national flag right, yay right, you know right, right. kind of a completely uncritical approach to that right. suddenly they kind of go wait but all these you know these imbeciles these corrupt um pieces of crap are impeaching her on the most flimsy grounds and you know supposedly these are the people who are going to lead to a better brazil hang on hang on a second so you know then the, the kind of tone of, of international reporting even changes right um, and that's the that's the major first stage of, of the coup, I guess, of the soft coup, her impeachment. Um, then they bring in this massive austerity program, the constitutional ceiling on spending, which I've already mentioned. Uh, they try to get pension reform passed. They don't manage it. But they basically rip up uh, Brazil's longstanding labor rights um, structure. Mm -hmm. uh, this is by no means perfect. It was a kind of a corporate, corporatist, Mussolini-inspired uh, sort of thing. Um so again, by no means perfect, but what come you know to, to rip up these labor rights, guaranteeing um, certain benefits, salaries, and so on, uh, leads to a much more precarious situation, right? So it's it's a deliberate cre creation of greater precarity um, in, under Brazilian capitalism. And and I mean, just just you know, uh, briefly, what I mean, and about, I just want to say too, when I was mentioning things like the Atlas Project earlier, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I don't think this was some sort of premeditated, preconcocted plot, but I do think that, you know, in the same way that you know, Alec isn't a conspiracy; it's just a playbook for state to state, you know, far right politics and those who want to serve, you know, those corporate interests. I think you know, similarly, there's a that's essentially the same model in Latin America. So you don't need to have any type of pre-plan or instigation you just need to have a you know kind of model and an ideology set and a strategy for you know utilizing the organic uprisings in the way that you know you've just painted so well for us really briefly um what is the actual i mean the, he's going to jail for 12 years and i think undoubtedly the bigger story here is is this coup process soft coup judicial coup process and the fact that it's a maneuver for brutal austerity. Uh, but, you know, so I, uh, but I'm not, you know, I, I think it's a travesty, but I, it, that's like the big story. But I mean, what what's the substance of the actual charge against Lula? And is, is the evidence, I guess, I mean, I have a bias, obviously, but is the evidence as sketchy as it appears? It is. And yeah. a lot of, you know, kind of top legal commentators have um, cast doubt on, on the substance of, of the evidence. And, um, even you know th this was this was remarkable. One of the leading anti-pechista, so anti-workers parties, uh, newspaper columnists of the right, uh, consistently hostile over the past three years to the workers party, came out and said wrote wrote an, wrote an opinion piece last week saying you know what this is dodgy. <laughs> right. So if even he's saying it, you know it is dodgy. Right. Do I think Lula is innocent? No, as we discussed, he was corrupted. Um, he I don't think he was personally corrupt. Um, but I do think that, you know, he was, he was corrupted. He played the game as we discussed kind of earlier on. Right. So, but, but this, the actual substance of charge of, of the charges against him is that he received a, a gift, which was unregistered, um, which was, uh, an, a, a beachfront apartment at a triplex in a, in a kind of middling seaside town. You know, it's not even like the, the swankiest thing that could be imagined as a gift. Right. Um, I'm sure I'm sure much, uh, much, much grander gifts have been given out, doled out to Brazilian politicians over the years. So but there's nothing tying to him, tying him to this. Um, it's not under his name. They don't have any concrete evidence. So even if you think and most of the Brazilian right think he's definitely guilty, they don't have the evidence. And if you're doing this in the name of the rule of law, of transparency and so on, well, you know, you've got to you've got to play by your own rules and make sure that you've got that evidence. Right. They don't. Um, and the whole process has been really expedited relative to similar other cases. So it's been about it's been done at about twice the speed. 
So the initial judgment, uh, the appeals process, the decision to imprison him now with appeals still pending, which isn't the normal way this should happen. Um, but they wanted their victory. And the leading uh, investigator, who's also the, the kind of investigating judge, who's also the prosecutor, um, is, uh, you know, wanted his victory. He wanted to get Lula in prison, which has been the Wait, the, the judge kind of is also Brazilian the right. prosecutor. I just exactly. To this is the, the, the Brazilian uh, legal system is really antiquated. It's kind of inherited from Portugal from the kind of early modern period. Uh, and it's called a kind of neo-inquisitorial system, uh, which is which is deeply problematic, um, <laughs> as you can imagine. So I think that's but, fair. You know, but Moro wanted, wanted his victory, wanted to take Lula in. I compared it in an article I wrote for Jacobin last week to uh, – this is George W. Bush on uh, the aircraft carrier declaring mission accomplished in uh, – what was it? May 2013 in Iraq. Right, right. So you can think, you know, greatly premature. Or May 20th, um, a vi- 2003, yeah. right? Sorry, 2003, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was, it was premature. It was a vain act and ultimately disastrous because what comes after is, is not a victory at all. But, um, you know, effectively the, the, the kind of the corruption and downfall of, of the Brazilian Republic, which is kind of what I think happens. Um, so then, all right, there's three different things I want to touch on as briefly as we can, but there, we can't leave the conversation without it. So I'll, actually, I, want, we will, I guess we'll get back to Lula in the context of the presidential race and then maybe even some of the broader regional dynamics briefly. But I, I want to just bring into this conversation because you did mention that there is an overtly fascist candidate. And you actually use that term, you know, carefully and non-provocatively, who is, uh, in fact, with Lula taken out, probably the lead contender to be president of Brazil. Yep. There's a whole other uh, context in Brazil that is another area we could criticize the Workers' Party, I think, pretty rigorously for, of not addressing um, you know, police violence and police killings, also paramilitaries that are sort of at the nexus of kind of police corruption and systemic organized crime and their relationship to politics, a deep violence. And this was... Uh, exemplified in the assassination of a prominent uh, a city councilor and activist um, a couple of weeks ago as well, which some on the right actually celebrated. And, you know, we'll explain her in a second, but this is not Workers' Party. I mean, this is somebody much more of the, you know, sort of much more significant left and rooted in, uh, you know, urban communities that are still subject to just tremendous violence throughout all of these periods. That's absolutely right. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with any of that, and I think that's a that's a perfect summation of it. Um, but just to paint you a picture of the the mood of anti-pechismo to as a way of and what was her name? Explain. I realize I totally neglected. So like, yeah, was, Marielle, yeah, Marielle Franco, yes. um, and her, and her driver Anderson as well were were both assassinated. Right. Um, and that is probably tied to local militias who now control more territory in in Rio de Janeiro than do the drug gangs. Right. Um, and these and you know the, to to be explicit about who these are. These militias are off-duty or former policemen, right? Military policemen uh, and even military officers as well um, or military privates. Um, So, and and you're right to say that this is something that the workers' government didn't tackle uh, over over the period. So the the kind of degree of urban violence um, is a major factor and is something that if it becomes the major topic um, of the elections, the security situation, that favors the right. Uh, and so it, we can maybe get on to a little yeah. bit in a second about kind of what the what the state of play is with, with the upcoming elections. But um, to paint a picture of anti pechismo as it's called, anti-workers party sentiment, but which really applies to the whole of the left, it's not just the workers party. Um, so w- what have you had recently? You had um, Lula's traveling caravan was shot at a couple of weeks ago while he was touring the south. Right. Um, that's bad enough. Um, no one was hurt. It was they just shot at the bus. But to make things worse, São Paulo's governor, who has uh, run and lost for the presidency against Lula in twenty in two thousand six, um, and is set to run again, uh, he came out immediately and said, "Well, this is the Workers' Party reaping what it sows. If you have a rhetoric of division and us and them, this is what you get." Which is really shocking. And I really do not like to use the word fascist because uh, I think it's used as an insult rather than a scientific term. I try to avoid using it. But is this not fascist rhetoric to say that if you pursue class politics in one of the most uneven societies in the world, uh, then you deserve violence and repression in in response? So that's really worrying. That just paints a little bit of a picture. Um, You know, there's other there's other little examples which I can paint. So there's a brothel owner. 
owns the biggest kind of chain of brothels in, in Brazil, uh, who's actually uh, been found guilty of tax evasion and isn't in prison because he had his habeas corpus rights upheld, something that Lula didn't have. Um, he's promising a month's free beer to anyone who kills Lula in prison. Um, Lula on, on his way to prison being taken in an airplane. There was a recording which was captured uh, of, uh, of kind of guards taking him there, taking him to prison in the airplane saying, should we, sh- we should really throw this trash out the window meaning Lula. Yep. Uh, and then someone comes on the radio going, we shouldn't be talking about this. Can you please change frequency? <laughs> um, so this just paints a little picture of the hostility of the Brazilian right to Lula, to the Workers' Party and to the left. Uh, and this hostile atmosphere does um, breed support for this kind of you know hard right authoritarian candidate, Jair Bolsonaro. But it also beyond that, even if you think that and some people are saying that maybe his ceiling is such that, you know, he should he isn't that much of a threat that he should be able to be defeated by a more centrist candidate. The thing is, in Brazil today is that there hardly are any centrist candidates. I mean, you could say that Lula and the Workers' Party embody the Brazilian right. political center better That's than anyone That's what I else. would say. Yes. They are the they are the center and the guarantors of the social rights embedded in the 1980 Constitution. They best represent that. They are the political center. The parties of the center right who should, you know, theoretically be part of the kind of big center, the St. Trong, as it's called here. Um, they are increasingly moving to the right, uh, both economically and in terms of security, uh, in terms of repression and so on, as um, the, the the quote I just mentioned from the Sao Paulo uh, governor of the supposedly social democratic center-right party uh, attests to. So in this atmosphere, it's very hard for us to imagine what a, what a kind of centrist candidacy looks like. And... Um, What's actually been going on, the Brazilian elite has been doing uh, what uh, my collaborator Benjamin Fogel memorably called the Tinder strategy. So this is what the the Brazilian elite are doing. It's a Tinder strategy. They keep swiping right until something matches. There's like tons and tons of candidates on the right all running. um, And and none of them kind of are garnering massive support, you know, much less than Lula and less than Bolsonaro, the far right candidate. Um, And I think the elite's just hoping that one of these catches fire and that they'll just throw their weight behind that guy. Um, if he seems to have any sort of popularity. But this is, shows how desperate the right is. You know? so, so for all that the left is in a complete mess and is on the back foot, um, the right's also a mess. The right's really fragmented, and they don't have any support. So, so what's the strategy? I mean, I, I, you know, <laughs> I, it's so obvious. I mean, if Lula could run, I think it's, I mean, all opinion polls suggest he would win again in spite of all of this, you know, this, this political terrorism from the right. Um, so what is the strategy here? I mean, does it have to be mass mobilization? Is there an electoral strategy? What, you know, what can be done? So, um, okay, let's start with one thing. So the, the kind of main, um, left candidates, other than Lula or whoever his stand-in is from the Workers' Party. You've got the Party of Socialism and Liberty running a candidate, uh, someone who I've mentioned before, yep. a party I've mentioned before, and is Marielle, the assassinated Marielle Franco's party. Um, mm-hmm. You've got the um, PC Dubé, the one of the Brazilian Communist Party, a kind of ex-Maoist party, but which is the most sort of nationalist on the left, I suppose, um, mm-hmm. also running a candidate, which they haven't done for years and years. Um, and they're now talking about creating a broad front, a broad front against fascism. Right. Um, I'm not sure what that actually means, because if you're creating a broad front, it has to be more than just left unity. You have to bring in the center. You have to bring in liberals and so on who are also concerned. But as I've just painted, the bottom has fallen out of that kind of liberal center. So mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what that what a broad front means beyond just saying us leftists should huddle together. Um Electorally, I'm not sure what the what is what is going to happen. I mean, there's suggestion that Lula will throw his weight behind because he's not going to be able to run. I mean, he's going to be discounted from the the, the electoral game. The um, both the judiciary, the media, and so on will not have gone to the lengths that they've gone over the past years to discredit uh, and take out of office the Workers Party to then allow Lula to run and win. They're so not. It's a coup. I mean, that's it. That's, it that, is. It, I mean, it's 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 flagrantly yeah. anti-democratic. Right. Um, and you know, for all that he might, Lula might be guilty of these corruption charges. Uh, taking someone out of the race who has, you know, forty percent of voting intentions uh, is anti-democratic, whatever way you look at it. Right. Um, so maybe he's going to be able to do as he did with Juma and throw his support to someone else, and that'll be enough to see them over the line, or at least to make it to the second round. It's unclear. Um, 
mobilization is necessary. I think that the kind of message from most, most, most of the Brazilian left is we have to defend Lula, not Lula as a candidate nor as his program, but to defend uh, Lula's right to be free and to run in the election. That's as how a I see it. Right. Demand. And yeah. I think that's absolutely correct. Right. Um, Lula's imprisonment is anti-democratic. So and, and this is and it signals Brazil, Brazil's elite break with democracy. You know, this is this is supposedly their republic. Right. And they don't. Uh, they don't believe in it. They don't. They don't back it. They've broken with with all institutional and constitutional norms. Um, in let's talk a little bit. If I if we got a second, I guess. Yeah, we, about, got, we have a few more minutes. Yeah, go ahead. So, in terms of w what the left strategy is, or at least let's talk about program, because what is missing so far, and what I'd like to see more of, it'll be interesting to see over the over the coming weeks and months whether there's a real developmentalist strategy that's put forward. Because there's no one really, there's only one candidate on the kind of center left who really proposes a developmentalist program, and you know we know that the, the possibilities for um, a sort of left developmentalism is are are, are narrow. That you know. The, you don't have a huge room for maneuver if you really confront international capital and um, you know pursue much more protectionist protectionistic uh, means as a means of development. You're gonna you're gonna face serious problems, right? There might be capital flight. You impose capital controls and so on. So it's unclear where where that leads. Um, but I do think that that needs to be a major plank of the program and the way for the left to win, uh, at least electorally, would be to foreground the economy because the right doesn't really want to talk about it. They just want to talk about security. Mm -hmm. And so to push the economy forward and to push the question of unemployment and wages is, you know, the way is would be the way forward. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens there. That sounds evocative of everywhere else in terms of what the left strategy should be. But I mean, final question. I mean, you know, I mentioned this last night when you did a brief update on my show and I and even, you know, this the con like you know basically the sort of radical critique going back to marx which all of a sudden seems to be sort of disturbingly relevant that if if not you know if if essentially that if lula cannot if that model is not workable where he actually created all the flaws we've documented, but there's another way of reading the guy as just the sort of ultimate win-win politician. You know, he created a system where, you know, the elites were placated, they didn't have a meltdown, there was no structural reform, so they were, you know, they were beyond taken care of, um, setting aside all normative and structural considerations. And then tens of millions of people are lifted out of poverty. And also the guy leaves, you know, office with a plus 80% approval rating. In that if a if 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 the brazilian state and in the context of a you know broader global pattern that we can see of you know emergent far right governance and you know basically capital sort of you know saying no i mean you know we're we look at I mean, we talked about the ryan budget before you came on right like we cannot even have the most mm. minimal small scale social interventions it all needs to be eaten up in the kind of final dash to you know, eat up whatever little commons remain to redistribute to the, you know, 0.1% or, you know, shareholder classes. What does that mean for, you know, I think even the most radical among us are still our default setting is, can we figure out some type of social democracy? I mean, if we're being <laughs> weird, real, because that's even all that we can imagine in many cases, if we're being real. This to so, me shows like that it, it's become if Lula can't do it, if this model doesn't work, then I, whoa, then that game is over. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I don't think we can say that the, the politics of the semi periphery are the same as that in the core. Sure. But sure. nevertheless, let me just talk about let me just talk a little bit about what Lula's model was, what Lulismo fundamentally is as a way of saying why this can't work anymore. So Lulismo is basically class conciliation. It is an alliance between organized workers, um, some of the poor, it, and this is an electoral alliance rather than anything else, but right. um, the, the working class, the poor, with support of this so-called patriotic domestic bourgeoisie. So in Brazil, kind of construction, agribusiness, and so on, right. um, who would lend them support, would fund the party, and so on. That model does not work anymore, as we have seen, because either that you know, so-called patriotic domestic bourgeoisie does not exist um, because they're not patriotic. They don't want to play ball anymore or certain sections of it have been devastated by the anti-corruption investigations, specifically um, and above all construction. 
So that model just does not work anymore. And the kind of representatives of, of that sort of alliance, the PMDB, this kind of cr big corrupt cartel party um, that occupies, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, Brazilian politics. Uh, this is, you know, the President Temer's party. Um, the Workers' Party still kind of seem to be, you know, creating alliances with them. Certainly at the local level, they continue wow. to do so. So they're still in bed with their hangmen, basically. Yep. Um, and so it seems they have not learned the lesson that, you know, if you lay with dogs, you're going to get fleas. And probably a lot worse than fleas uh, has happened to, to the Workers' Party right now. Right. So that model doesn't work. So it needs to be a much more confrontational approach from the left. Yep. There's no two ways about it. Um but to what do, you know to how far can that be can you be confrontational in terms of in, in real policy terms that i'm not really clear on um to to kind of refer back a little bit more historically and to to you know make a make a call back to what you were talking about i think throughout the the 20th century certainly the second half of the 20th century the condition of reform was revolution right it was a threat of revolution yep. uh, at home as well as the threat of the soviet union which held together this compact of of kind of moderate reformism Nowadays, that's not the case. And I would wager that it's maybe the opposite, that the condition for a possible future revolution would be reform today to yep. get those wheels of reform is moving. And yep. I think the um, the ceiling for and, and the kind of room for maneuver cap of capital today is so limited that they do not allow um, the outside to come into politics. Right. This is what what's happened in Brazil. Right. Yep. So. Lula was allowed in, in the, during the good times to, to kind of manage Brazilian capitalism. Now they don't tolerate that anymore. Um, right. So I think very quickly, if you start kind of pushing for reforms, you're going to face some serious barriers. And who knows if, if the left president is elected in, in, in October 2018, uh, how long they'll even last. I don't want to be too gloomy about it, but, um, but you know, it doesn't, look too, it doesn't look too sunny. But maybe the only global lesson, though, is... I mean, I mean, first of all, that you you do literally need street mobilization to go on, go alongside this stuff, because if you aren't in some type of constant mobilization, this will just get run out anyways. And then number two, in a way, of course, you, you need if you're going to govern in this context, you need you can't, you know, just you, you can't have socialism in one country. Right. You can't you know, I mean, you can't totally throw out the global macroeconomic playbook or you're going to have a meltdown, even if you are like the UK. But at the same time. You might as well push the dial to the most sort of radical end of possibility of governance because they're going to respond to you with the same ferocity and insanity anyways. Even if you play nice. Even, even if you, if play, you nice, play nice, right. I mean, and look I at think... Lula and Obama, right? I mean, how much nicer can you be? They still, I mean, Lula's in prison and Obama's a communist Muslim antichrist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think this is possible, you know, there's a lot more room for maneuver in the US, right. and even in the UK, just for example, right. than there is in Brazil. Right. And I think in Brazil, given the global context, given the fact that the pink wave is over, so you don't have, you know, the, the kind of regional support that there was, you don't have the commodity super cycle um, to, to be able to actually spend on things. In that context, the room for maneuver in Brazil is a lot more limited. Right. And I think we have to be conscious of this. And if you start pushing too hard, you're either you're going to have a fork in the road and either you moderate your demands or you go Cuba. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I'm not sure what I choose there. So um, I'm getting disturbed by what answer I might have for that. Um, <laughs> Alex, I appreciate your time. Alex Huckley, he is the producer and co-host of the Alpha Bunga Bunga Global Politics Podcast, of which I'm a happy subscriber to. He's also a writer and researcher. You can find regular pieces on really essential pieces on Brazil and Jacobin and uh, other outlets uh, based in Sao Paulo. Alex, thanks so much. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go to the fun half, dude. It's the fun half. Become a member of the Majority Report, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how you access the fun half. You can also go to justcoffee.coop coffee tea or chocolate use the coupon code majority you can check out my show at patreon.com slash tmbs or on itunes and our youtube channel watch the whole friggin thing jamie peck has a patreon she also has an antifada podcast oh yeah um we're doing our hard launch episode this weekend so anyone who wants to submit a question for our friend liza featherstone who writes an advice column in The Nation, um, you can join and submit questions through Discord. She's a smarty. Um, 
Yes, those are all the ways. Uh, join all of these things. We'll see you in the fun half. 646-257-3920. 646-257-3920. IAMS will be on. <laughs>